Welcome to the Rounds to Residency podcast, brought to you by Med School Coach. Each episode, get clinical rotation advice and tips to prepare for your externships and residency in healthcare. We interview preceptors and physician educators who will prepare you for your rotation and improve your clinical experience. Now, here's your host, Chase DeMarco. Today's episode, we have a special dual guest episode coming on with Lindsay Shipley and Dr. Jack Penner. They are both members of a very important podcast you should probably listen to if you haven't already called the Clinical Problem Solvers. And they really help to get into the clinical mindset and critical thinking aspects of medicine. So Dr. Shipley and Penner, thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, thank you so much. Absolutely thrilled to be here. Thanks so much for having us, Chase. Really excited to be here. It looks like Lindsay, you're in Alabama and you're about to become the chief medical resident. Is that accurate? That's correct. At UAB. Great. Nice. And Jack, you are currently the chief resident at UCSF. Similarly to Lindsay, we'll also be starting my chief year in a couple months. So I'm currently in my third year of residency. Oh, that's what rising chief resident means. Okay. <laughs> I, l- I like how you phrase that in your bio. <laughs> so you both cover, well, a lot of important topics in medical education, and especially something we like to really discuss here, and that's going into the clinical medicine aspect of your training, how to really approach things. It's so much different than the book studying you've been doing before and all the cue banks. And as much as they try to elaborate on those every year, real life is very, very different. So if you have a, I don't know, a quick one-liner or something about what you think the main difference is between these, I'd be curious to know. Then I'll start with the actual icebreaker. I'm throwing you a curveball, sorry. <laughs> no problem. You know, the difference in basic science and like the clinical science and the clinical learning that you need to do is basic science, you're learning about how majority of disease processes present and management of those And then in clinical medicine, you're trying to figure out what disease does the patient have? How can I manage this particular patient? And what thought processes or things have to be done or ruled out in order to best treat and diagnose this patient? And a lot of that we do on clinical problem solvers is focus on diagnosis because in internal medicine, our main job is to figure out the correct diagnosis and get the correct management, but you're not going to get to the correct management without the correct diagnosis. And so I think that's why we really focus on reasoning and diagnostic reasoning is to kind of get to that point. And so going back to your question, you know, I feel like the pre-med first two years or first year, depending on where you train is mainly focused on telling you about a broad range of diseases and how they present, but doesn't really give you a good framework for how to figure out what a particular patient has. And that's really what you learn in your second, third, or fourth year. Yeah, I completely agree with everything Lindsay said. I think the other piece that I felt like was a really steep learning curve in the clinical years was not only is there all this new content that you're applying in a different order. So rather than going from disease and working backwards, we're now sort of going from symptom towards diagnosis. The other thing that happens is that I feel like we also are doing that in a brand new context. And so rather than having to understand and memorize terms, like to be able to list the symptoms of a certain disease, you're sort of translating these very human elements of clinical medicine into the words that you learn, right? So I could, going into my third year of medicine, I could say septic arthritis looked like an acute monoarticular arthritis of a large joint, but what that actually looked like was still foreign and still very un familiar. And so I think you're sort of learning how to translate these ideas into what they look like in reality and doing that in a very complex healthcare setting that involves interprofessional team members and other members of the health systems team. And I think the last piece is that while as a medical student, you learn a list of different therapies or a list of different tests to do, not all of those tests happen at the same time. Not all of those treatments need to be delivered at the same time. And so there's also a huge element of prioritization that I feel like we get to learn. So how do we apply the knowledge that we build and the knowledge that we organize in our brain to the specific context that we're in, whether it's the clinic, the inpatient setting, or the intensive care unit? That's very interesting. I find, at least with my past studies, it was very difficult to make that translation, make that transition from, 
the you know text-based questions and problems, and they're formatted in a very specific way. They have certain rules and regulations to follow. But when you go into the clinical setting, it's much more complicated. It's infinitely more complicated. So thinking in that way, or just learning how to think that way, if you weren't actually taught to think that way in medical school before that point, is very difficult. I think a lot of students struggle with it, but that experiential learning is so much stronger in the end. That's what makes you a physician, I suppose. Exactly. What do you think is some of the biggest challenges, either this past year, this past residency match, or maybe even the upcoming year for residents in internal medicine? I think a couple things is specifically with the match process was having to make these really foundational decisions with a limited data set. I think the fact that the match happened virtually this year was really important for a number of reasons in terms of leveling the financial playing field, making the financial toll of the residency application process and the interview season, uh, making that toll less steep. And what came with that was, I think, problems that we saw with equity in terms of learners having access to places where they could attend their virtual interviews or not be judged on the environment in which they were taking their residency interviews. And also the fact that to have to absorb a culture of a program and a culture of an institution from Zoom is incredibly challenging. So I think to make stressful decisions that require a lot of nuance and require, I think, an ability to make an accurate assessment of a program, to do that in a brand new format in a very new way, I think that was a big challenge for the residency process from some of the medical students who I've had the chance to talk to. And then I think overall, with the changes that the pandemic has brought into all of our social lives, period, but also to the social lives and the social structures within a residency program. I think resident, resident well-being has been a huge challenge where you've had sort of many aspects of normal life upended. This has come during what has been an important, but also really emotionally draining reckoning with things like social justice and racial injustice, especially for learners of color and Black learners. And I think that from the conversations that I've been able to be a part of and what I've been able to listen to is I think for all learners and especially learners who are underrepresented in medicine, we've seen what I think has been a really challenging year for mental health. And I personally have felt the toll of it. And I think without that well-being being in place, it's really hard to sort of layer learning on top of that. Like I think that sort of is the foundation of all the learning that we're able to do. And I think that's been, you know, as a trainee who is a white man to talk about my experience of racial injustice would be to center myself in a conversation that I don't deserve to be centered in. So for those of you who are listening to this podcast, I would say that these reflections are coming with the encouragement to take a listen to the Clinical Problem Solvers Anti-Racism in Medicine series, which has really, I think, done a phenomenal job of exploring these types of topics, both in terms of racism in medicine as a whole, and also the toll that racism within the medical education system can take on learners. Big topics there. Oh, Lindsay, do you have anything to add to there? Because we're almost on different sides of the country here as far as your residency program. So I'm also curious to know if there might be different things going on in different states within the nation currently. I totally agree with everything that Jack said. And yeah, those are very hard topics and some things that across the country we're all experiencing and dealing with at this time. And I think, you know, kind of moving forward, kind of like, what can we do for our residents? You know, me and Jack are both rising chief residents and we'll be part of the leadership trying to figure out what we can do to better support our residents and how to make sure that they have everything that they need. And our medical students will be attending on wards and we'll be helping out medical students as well, get to wherever they want to be in life. And so how can we best support and make changes based off what we've learned in the past couple of years? And I think that, you know, number one is the social aspect is so important. And the learning climate is number one, taking care of your medical students, taking care of your residents, putting them first. We are above all there for them and there for their education. Um, number one, our patients, number two, our students and our residents. And so I think just making sure you have that learning climate that's supportive and making sure that your team has everything that they need and make sure you're having fun and getting to know your team. COVID took a lot of social interactions away from us, but we luckily still had our team to come to work to every day and see, whereas a lot of people were forced to stay home and quarantine. I think that was one thing about the medical field that kept me going as I still got to go to work and see everybody every day, which was really nice even though a lot of the social aspects that we love to do outside of the hospital were taken away. 
And so I think just making sure that our residents feel supported, have social safe outings that we can continue to do and incorporate as we're able now that the vaccines have rolled out and making sure everybody on the team feels supported moving forward and making sure we're keeping a good diversity in our medical schools and our residencies. You know, the match has already happened, but just already planning for that next year, you know, interviewing is going to be in the fall in just a couple months. And me and Jack will be very involved with that. So just making sure that we're keeping diversity at the top of our minds whenever we're thinking about new residents to come to our programs, because we ultimately want a group of residents and physicians that match the patients that we're taking care of. And so I think focusing on that will only help out our patients in the long term. Great answers. Yeah, it's a very complex situation currently on multiple different levels. And it's going to be interesting to see how this next year's residency match goes, what changes might carry over from the past year and which ones are going to be new and which ones are going to be completely new as in they haven't been done in any past ones before. <laughs> but so. I am kind of curious because, like you said, the next match is going to start in all not too many months from now. And being that you two are intimately involved in many different aspects of residency right now as residents, what are some of the maybe interview tips that you would recommend, ways to really stand out as opposed to other students? I think, you know, number one is just kind of be yourself, kind of have an idea of what you want out of a program. And if that's you know, a region of the country restriction, that's okay. Or if there's something else that you're interested in, that's okay as well. You know, just kind of go into your interview, kind of knowing what you want out of a program and honestly, just answer honestly, be yourself. I know it sounds simple and probably a little cliche, but it is so true. Whenever I see somebody at a residency interview or talking to someone that's relaxed and, you know, just kind of there to hang out and just have a conversation because we're ultimately looking for residents that are going to thrive in our program. And thrive is different for every program because we can offer different things in other programs. And so it's not that every applicant needs to look the exact same, right? They're going to look different for different programs because different programs offer a lot of different things. And so we are just looking for residents that are going to thrive in our program. And that's very different than what may thrive somewhere, a person that may thrive somewhere else. And so I think just being your authentic self and having an idea. You don't have to know everything that you want to do down to what you're going to be doing in 10 years, but just have an idea of what's most important to you when you go into the interview. I completely agree with everything Lindsay said, as usual. I think it can feel a little bit trite to say that self-awareness is incredibly important. And I will say that at the risk of even being trite, I think that it really is. I felt like going through the residency application process, I was initially very focused on crafting myself in the image of what I thought programs wanted to see. And I had a mentor and she really infused into me the idea that the only way to find the right program for you is to put your authentic self forward in the application process. And I think that what that does is that it hopefully combats the narrative that there is a small number of fantastic programs that are right for every learner. And rather, it positions the learner at the center of the conversation. And exactly as Lindsay says, what thriving looks like is going to be different for each learner. And thus, what the program that each person will thrive in might look different for different people. And so I think that introspection around understanding what you're looking for in your career, whether it's a community-focused career, an academically-focused career, research, education, health systems leadership, a subspecialty, those types of questions allow you to start to understand what it is that you're specifically looking for, and then to find those types of programs. And the only way a program can know that you'll be the right fit for them is if you are your authentic self in that process. And so the medical school application process felt very much like we were all trying to fit a mold. And I found that very frustrating and very draining. And I think I initially went into the residency application process with a similar mindset and was lucky to have that mentor who helped me sort of flip that mentality and really say, you know, what is it that I'm looking for as I start to launch my true career as a clinician? And how can I communicate those types of desires to the programs that I'm looking at so that they're not only able to find somebody who they might want in their program, but that I'm able to find those programs as well. Because I think the more that we remind ourselves that in many ways, while we aren't in the driver's seat, 
when it comes to how we present ourselves to programs and the types of things that we choose to prioritize in the programs that we rank, those types of things are the things that are absolutely within our control and the things that I think are worth focusing on throughout the application process. Good points. Yeah, I think that as a pre-med, you hear fake it till you make it. And in med school, you hear fake it till you make it. You constantly are being told this throughout the academic journey. And you probably feel like that same mentality should go into residency because, well, it's competitive and you don't want to be one of the several thousand, I think, this year that wasn't able to fit into a program. So that fear is always there. But like you said, for the long term gain of both you and the residency program, being authentic is going to cause the best match and least stress, burnouts, negative consequences of it in the long run. So I really like that one. (laughs) Clinical preceptors are busy professionals as is, and those wishing to give back to the academic community can be overburdened by scheduling and paperwork. With the Find a Rotation platform, physicians looking to precept students can register for their free account, control calendar availabilities, set preferences, and be done. Our system automates and simplifies much of the process. Register for your free account now by visiting findarotation.com for more information. That's Find a Rotation, your medical and healthcare clinical rotations platform. Lindsay, what are some particular maybe characteristics or even future life goals that you think make someone a better match for internal medicine than maybe another specialty? Probably someone who really likes to think and analyze processes. We do a lot, a lot of that. Sometimes to the annoyance of some of our maybe surgical colleagues. And so I want to do gastroenterology. So I'm kind of one of those mixes, very procedural, but then also very medicine likes to think. And so I was honestly between surgery and then medicine and then GI for the longest time when I was in medical school. And then I had an internal medicine rotation. And I remember we were on rounds and we were discussing acid base forever. And I thought it was just fascinating. And I was like, okay, I really enjoy thinking the critical thinking process and really trying to figure out why all of these things are different because the medicine patients are just more complex. It's not that the surgeons don't do similar critical thinking that we do. It's just the medicine patients that we get are a little more complex from a medicine standpoint. So there's a lot more thinking. There's a lot more processing to do. If there's a really critical or if there's a really complex medicine patient, they're usually admitted to medicine and then surgery will be consulted for a procedure. And so I think I really enjoyed the critical thinking and the clinical reasoning, which is probably why I ended up here on this podcast, (laughs) able to work with Jack every day and, and be here. But I really just love that process. And you learn so much just from all the wonderful people I've had the opportunity to work with and learn for. And so I think probably that and never giving up on asking why and figuring out why. So why does the patient have this or why did they come up in with this? And we just keep going until we figure it out. <laughs> and then that might be a great segue into, well, clinical problem solving, because we can't have the both of you on here and not discuss the process of clinical problem solving a little bit. What are some mistakes people make? What's the process? What's uh, lots of questions I'm sure we can ask. So maybe we'll pass this to Jack. And do you want to give us maybe the starting point or basic outline of how you approach the complex clinical problem solving aspects you've run across? Sure. Yeah. I guess to sort of boil down clinical problem solving or clinical reasoning, I think it is something that all physicians do. And it's how we both translate the data that patients provide us with and gather further data to basically answer the question that patients bring into the hospital with them. For example, what is the cause of their chest pain? What is the cause of their shortness of breath? What is the cause of their fevers? And so it's a combination of collecting data, interpreting data, synthesizing information. And then I think fundamentally at the end of it is weighing probabilities to both inform diagnostic tests and treatment decisions as we work to arrive at a final diagnosis. It is essentially how we solve clinical problems. And so while it is, I think, a cornerstone of an internist job, right? I think we sometimes joke about how the fact that a surgeon's procedure is surgery, an internist procedure is clinical reasoning. 
But I think at its core is asking and answering questions using patient provided information as well as the medical literature that, that's up there. In terms of how we do it, I think a more complex process, but really it, it relies on a few things. I think it, it relies on well-organized knowledge. So it, knowledge doesn't have to be encyclopedic. You don't need to know everything. And, and in fact, I would say prioritizing an organized fund of knowledge is more important than prioritizing an extensive breadth of knowledge because we oftentimes see similar diagnoses that come into the hospital. Becoming an expert in the common diagnoses will oftentimes pay higher dividends than becoming an expert in the really rare diagnoses that you might see once in a career. But how we organize that knowledge allows us to access the things that we store in our long-term memory on the fly. And I would say it's also in addition to having well-organized knowledge, it's about effective communication. That's how we oftentimes gather data from patients. And then it's about being able to ask and answer questions. And so we're not reasoning in a vacuum. We have all kinds of tools and technologies and literature at our disposal now, oftentimes at our fingertips. And so asking questions and knowing where to find answers, I think is the third key piece. And I would say the fourth piece that sort of surrounds all of these other three things is just humility. I think it's pretty hard to... Medicine has a very nice way of keeping you humble. The moment that we start to feel like we know more than we do, there oftentimes is a reminder around the corner. And unfortunately, those kinds of reminders can be things that potentially compromise patient safety. And so I think always just keeping a healthy relationship with the question, what if I'm wrong here? It can keep us from avoiding one of the fatal flaws of clinical reasoning, which is arrogance. I like it. Well, then I think I have one more question here really before kind of a wrap up last minute pearls. And I guess I can pass this one to Lindsay. Since, you know, as we just sort of discussed, there's that big difference in thinking outside the box and thinking about mastering common ailments versus maybe thinking about those zebras. But it seems like many aspects, like the basic sciences, the step one exam in particular, had a lot of those rare diseases. We seem to sort of get in this, I don't know what, <laughs> what term I'm trying to think of right now, get in the mindset that there's just way too many possibilities and then we don't master those foundational illnesses that we're going to run into a lot. Is there any better way to improve this prior to residency or what would be a good way to approach that? Yeah, I think one thing that may be good is to try to figure out during your clinical rotations, the base rate of disease. So basically what that means is how common are certain disease processes and how uncommon are other disease processes. And I think that's one thing that maybe isn't taught as well as it could be in, in medical school, because the amount of COPD, the amount of heart failure, the amount of decompensated liver disease that you're going to see as a first year resident is way more than any of the zebras, which I've probably forgotten the names of the things that we were asked on the step one and step two exams that were the zebras that I just haven't heard of because you haven't seen them and you're not exposed to them but that doesn't mean you shouldn't have them in the back of your mind. And so I think what you should do is just kind of really focus on understanding the common disease processes. So the ones that present most all the time and recognizing clues when maybe that there's something else going on. So you're thinking a patient's presenting with a run of the mill COPD exacerbation, but wait, eosinophils are high. That is not in my illness script for COPD exacerbation. I can use that though, and then look it up and try to figure out, okay, what's a differential for eosinophilia? You don't have to know everything, but you do probably need to figure out those disease processes that present commonly and when maybe you should switch from system one thinking to system two thinking, take a pause and then try to figure out what is causing the abnormality that you're not used to seeing in a COPD exacerbation or any other disease process. So I think just trying to develop illness scripts for common diseases, realizing whenever you're seeing a patient, what doesn't fit, and then going to the back to the drawing board and trying to figure out how does this fit or how doesn't it? And what else should I be thinking about? Yeah, I think that's probably a difficult thing in your first couple of years and maybe even your early board exams because you're so used to certain illness scripts that, that that system one thinking, like you said, is there a lot. And if you try to switch system two thinking too much, well, you don't have much time on the exams to really balance that back and forth. So it can be really difficult for some students to really navigate how to approach that, I think. In the beginning, a lot of it is system two, because you're still learning a lot of the disease processes. You're still trying to develop your schemas and your illness scripts. And that's okay. 
eventually you'll get to where your majority system one and a couple times system two, but you'll get there. It just takes deliberate practice all the time. And even early on in medical school, if you're trying to memorize the things that you need to memorize for your test, which you should absolutely continue to do, just always think about it in the context of a patient. And there's a lot of different ways to try to get that started early. So obviously clinical problem solvers, that's why we're here, but there's also the human diagnosis series, quick cases that you can do. They post one every day and they're just quick cases that you can kind of run through and kind of build a differential. And it's just a good way to put in some deliberate practice every day. I will say I do not do them every day, but I try to do a couple a week, but it's just a good way to get started early, kind of thinking in that mindset. All right. Let's see, Jack, do you have any last minute thoughts or pearls of wisdom? I would just echo and re-emphasize Lindsay's comment about the importance of deliberate practice. I think I, in medical school, often took a cram approach to medical knowledge where, you know, we sort of, I felt like my preclinical years, oftentimes my life fluctuated with what my testing schedule was. And when there was a long time to a test, it was much more casual. And as the test approached, the study frequency and the study length oftentimes got longer and longer and more and more frequent. And I think moving into the clinical years, whether it's into the third and fourth year of medical school, or especially as you're going into residency and have really selected your field, the test focus shifts. And it shifts from a focus on these exams that you have over to how am I going to continue to improve over the rest of my life and over the rest of my career? And I think moving away from that sort of cram and jam process and moving towards one where it's about taking consistent reps in whatever field it is, whether it's your reasoning or your procedural skills, but just building in a routine that feels like it's attainable and consistent because that type of practice regimen, I think is incredibly helpful for knowledge consolidation. And then to move one step beyond merely having a routine. And that question is, well, how do we make that routine deliberate? And oftentimes it should be a little bit uncomfortable. It should be a little bit effortful. And I think there's sort of two principles that I have found valuable. One of them is focusing on recall. And so if you pull up the human diagnosis app and do a case, rather than saying, I'm going to click through until I get to the answer. Oh, it was a heart failure exacerbation. I could have got that. Yeah. If I look back at the information, I think I could have got that. Actually, Force yourself to think through and whether it's writing things down or mumbling it to yourself or just thinking what types of diagnoses you would come up with and how the information is altering your differential diagnosis, making it be a little bit uncomfortable because that type of deliberate element is what forces us to recall information. And that's one of the best ways that we can test our knowledge in our practice regimens. And then the second piece I think is always asking, what am I gonna take to the next patient I see? And so the more and more that you can focus on taking the information that we learned today to make ourselves better tomorrow, the more likely it is that we're gonna identify the relevant information and the key information that's gonna improve our reasoning. And so making ourselves a little bit uncomfortable in our day-to-day -day practice, and then also trying to find information that we'll take to the next patient in whatever our practice regimen is. Love it. We cover deliberate practice a lot in the Medical Neminist podcast too. So anyone listening to that, if you'd like more details on how to apply that to your medical studies, feel free to check out those episodes. So Jack and Lindsay, this has been a great episode. Really loving the information that we've discussed so far. Of course, we can only cover so much at one time, so we'll probably have to have you guys on in the future. But where can the audience find out more about each one of you? Please do connect with the Clinical Problem Solvers on Twitter at CP solvers. And then maybe Lindsay and I can include our handles in the show notes. And then the most important thing, if you do one thing is continue to practice your clinical reasoning. Virtual morning report is something that we do every day. It's a case a day, an hour long discussion. You can do anything from just watch to participate in the zoom chat, to join us in the lukewarm seat and think through and talk through a case out loud with Lindsay, myself, or one of the other members of the Clinical Problem Solvers team. The purpose there is exactly what we were just talking about, to build in deliberate practice in your daily routine, but not just deliberate practice, deliberate practice with an incredible community and hopefully a whole lot of fun. Come to VMR on Clinical Problem Solvers. You'll see us in action. Great. All right. We'll definitely add those in the show notes. Dr. Lindsay Shipley and Dr. Jack Penner from the Clinical Problem Solvers, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks so much. Thanks for having us. The Rounds to Residency podcast is powered by MedSchool Coach. To access MedSchool Coach services, 
like USMLE tutoring or residency admissions advising, visit our website at medschoolcoach.com. Good luck as you prepare for your board exams, and we hope you tune in again next time.